Hey guys, today we are going to talk about math. I've mentioned that in our education system at home that we have here in our house with my kids, my kids are 13 and nine, that math is really core to everything that we do. I've also said that I am not a mathematician. I did, you know, elementary math, pre-algebra, algebra one, geometry, and algebra two, and then I was done. So when it comes to a lot of things that we learn, but math definitely, there's learning math and then there's using math or you know applied mathematics. I think that as we get older, we learn, we have less math to learn and more to use. I think that when you send your kids to a schooling system, and this makes sense, that the emphasis is on learning math. And so we learn, 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 learn. And then when we're out of school, it's like, great, I never have to use that. And I mean, it makes sense. A lot of the math that we use happens in life. And when you do your education here in a siloed sort of situation, and then you have life, sometimes we don't take those tools with us and then realize how much we, we can use them, like how empowered we are to use those tools. So when we do math here, like, you know, because I educate my kids here myself, we focus on learning, yes we do, but we really put a, a lot of emphasis on using math. And I don't mean in a lot of situations where it's like, oh, let's go to the pumpkin patch and if we're gonna buy five pumpkins and they weigh 20 pounds and they're 20 cents a piece, you know, it's not like that. I mean, we, we do use that, but it's, it's on doing budgets. It's on managing time. It, it's on things that, that happen more in life. Like, like not these funny little scenarios, but really like how do you manage, you know, time management is a very important thing for people to learn. There's learning involved, but there's also practicing involved and in, in math is a big piece in time management, for example. Like I said, in school, in education, the emphasis is primarily on learning math, but if you look at the span of your life, even just in a week or something, but also as we age, the vast majority of your mathematical juice or your mathematical mind is gonna be used on applied mathematics, not learning mathematics. All that said, today we're gonna to talk about more learning math because that's really important. Obviously you can't use something that you don't have, right? So you have to learn math before you can really use it. But sometimes the wanting to use math, like, oh, how much does that thing cost that I want? Sometimes that is what motivates a person, a child to go, oh, okay, I actually do want to learn that, even though I'm not necessarily into the concept of math itself for the sake of math, I do want to learn math because then I know what I need to do to be able to buy that thing that I want. You know, math is the bridge between where you are and what you want, whether it's buying something or whether it's having time for something or whether it's how far is that out of the way from what we're doing because I really wanna go there, whatever it is. Math is, is a bridge, it's a tool to get you where you wanna go. Okay, so learning math. My approach, our approach is about consistency and not rushing them, letting them kind of go. I know people say go at their own pace, go at a pace, but not a rushed pace. I think it's, it's important to keep moving forward, but as long as you're consistently learning math, over time you will you know, have those tools and kind of move forward. So it's about consistency, meaning we may take a week off here or there, you know, if we're traveling or if one of them just needs a break or, or I need a break, we may take a day off or a couple of days off or a week off. I think at most, maybe we've taken like two weeks off from learning math. We're always doing math, right? Because that's what life is. And when a, a question comes up for one of my kids and it involves math and you know, there have been times where they've been like, ah, never mind, I don't care. And I've, I've pushed it and said, well, no, you, you asked the question. I think you know you do want to do the thing, so let's figure it out. There are situations like that always, but in terms of learning, you know, maybe at most we've ever taken two weeks off, and I think that's really important. And I think being consistent about learning math will help your children to not hate math because it's not hard and then, oh, I don't have to do it, and then hard and then I don't have to do it. It's just slow and consistent. And sometimes my kids need kind of a break, but not a full break, and so we'll take a week off or a couple of weeks off from their core math curriculum to do something else. And I, I actually have materials behind me. You can see them back there, and I'll actually show you what I mean, specifically what we do. Hopefully this will be helpful, even if you don't use the same core curriculum or the same 
you know, in between kind of fun things, if, if you use a game instead of Life of Fred, Life of Fred is one of the things we do. If you're like, yeah, I don't really want to do Life of Fred, but you want to do games or you want to do math books because there are actually like storybooks like in the library that are math based. One series that we really like a lot is the Sir Conference series. So, you know, circumference is, you know, around a circle, but it's Sir, S-I-R, like a British knight and then Comference and the Knights of the Round Table. And it's very, it's a very fun, fanciful book series, but it uses math. So those are some of the fun things that we do if they need a little bit of a break, but like not a full break, we have things that we fill in. So even if you don't use the same things that, that I use or that we use, hopefully the buckets of, okay, here's a core curriculum, here's how we approach it. And then here's some of the fun things we do in between. Here's kind of the ethos of how we do it. I'm hoping that that's, that's helpful to you. I know that a lot of parents who decide to take on their kids' education and, you know, there's so many different approaches, right? There's, I'm primarily responsible for my kids' education, but once or twice a week, they go to like a project program where they do like hands-on learning, you know, whether it's carpentry or doing a play or, you know, a number of other things, science experiments, dissections, building a volcano, whether it's that, or it's, I'm sending my kids to a school where someone else is primarily educating them, but I want to supplement some things. Whatever that is, at least in my you know, anecdotal experience, that's primarily moms or women. And it's primarily women who go, oh no, I don't do math. Oh, I can't do math. No, 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 I don't do math. And you don't have to be a mathematician or yeah, like, like where people meet you and they're like, oh yeah, you're a math person to be able to help your kids with math and, and help them kind of sell, because any education is self-education really, right? Like if you don't want to know something and you're not curious at all about something, you will not learn it. It's just, you you won't. And, and that's why I say math is a bridge. You need to think of math as a bridge. Math in and of itself, there's very few people who are just like, yes, I'm just into math for the sake of math. You know, it's theoretical. It's if this, then that's all day playing with, you know, uh, like thought experiments and things like that. Most people who are in the world living today, whether they're good at math or not, you know, in their own minds, whether it's a bridge in their life to get them where they want to go or they don't recognize that, that's my opinion. Realizing that math in and of itself is not an end for most people, but it's, it's a way to get you to the life that you want to have. I mean, even gardening, you need to know the spacing, you need to figure out the water. There's, there's so much that is mathematical, right? So whatever it is that you want to do, math is the to the uh, main driver and main tool to get you there. And your embracing of math, just in general, is kind of going to determine how much you can embrace the world. So I know that with a video like this, it's primarily women who are watching it and women are the people who primarily say, oh no, math, oh no, 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 no. I don't even know what to do. You know, I'm getting the sweats just thinking about it. So I, that's why I, I want to say that specifically. I know that in my house growing up, my mom, my mom is very smart. Um, she's very capable. She's good at a lot of things. She's really good with her hands. She's very creative, but she always, my whole life that I can remember, oh no, dad helps you with math. I don't help you with math. Dad helps you with math. And now that I'm older and I'm a mom, I'm like, she totally could have done it. Totally. But she just told herself in her mind, like, I can't do this. I can't do this. So I'm telling you, most people, you can do this and it can actually be pretty fun. Until your children have learned division, again, this is my opinion, this is my experience. You know, you have counting, you have addition, you have subtraction, you know, then you have fast addition, which is multiplication and fast sub subtraction or pulling things apart, which is division. I feel like until your kids have mastered division, you have to be extremely patient with them. After that, you know, obviously it still requires patience, but they're doing fractions, they're doing decimals, they're doing percentages. And a lot of those things utilize addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So I do wanna say that, that until your kids have mastered those things, especially don't be in a rush, especially be consistent and just be extremely patient. My son picked up multiplication so easily so quickly because he was already asking questions. I mean, when he was five years old, yeah, five years old, I remember this because at that time we lived in Florida and this was a Florida memory. He, he had um, these, these like long pieces of wood. They were like building blocks, but they were long and thin, almost like Jenga blocks. 
and that we had gotten from Ikea. He had like a hundred of them and he would put them in groups and then count the groups. And then he would try to count by that number. And he just naturally did this himself. You know, he was kindergarten age. So he was really young, but he was asking questions like, instead of having to count, you know, imagining that they're like groups of soldiers, instead of having to count, you know, all of these to a hundred, if I do 20 in each group, can I count them faster? And so he, he was asking questions that took him there to where he was, learning multiplication when he was really young just because he was curious not about multiplication itself but in this example of these blocks and these you know soldiers and he wanted to know how how quickly could he count them he just didn't want to keep counting them and so he so he got there he got it multiplication isn't really hard i would guess for most children that age if they have a reason to want to understand how it works my daughter on the other hand Addition and subtraction, super easy for her. She is, you know, a different personality than him. She didn't ask as many like theoretical or hypothetical questions, but she is firmly squarely in this world. So she was very good at, you know, like if we had cookies or something, like she could very quickly figure out how many each person could have, or, you know, if each person had this many, how many days, they would last like she was always really good good at that which is division but it's also <clears throat> addition and subtraction she got that really quickly but when we focused on multiplication specifically even though she was asking questions you know that that took her to multiplication just making the leap something about it so i just did tables with her she would go through her program and then every few days when she would get really frustrated by a lesson or that it took so long to get through her pages i would say you know what let's set the pages to the side for a couple days and let's just do tables and so you know the drills that i know well i was born in the early 80s i don't know what age everyone is but but so for me when i say we used to i'm talking like in the night like 80s 90s we used to get these tables that would be like okay the zero table so it's zero times zero down to zero times 12 and then the ones table and then the twos table and we would just do these drills just to remember i would make those for her and they it was kind of hard finding exactly what i wanted online although there's a lot of stuff online maybe you can find what you would be looking for so i would just get a piece of lined paper like this and i i actually have some i have some downstairs but you can imagine what i'm what i'm doing so on the top i would have like the zero one two, three tables, and then, you know, zero through 12. And then down below it, I would have them all again, but they would be all jumbled up and mixed up. And, you know, you fold the paper in half so that they don't see the answers from the top half. And we would just go through those drills. And it's amazing how when you have them do it every day, sometimes on a weekend, sometimes not, just one single page of multiplication tables. It was amazing how quickly she was like, six times 12 is 72, boom, 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 you know, just kind of going down the line. We, we would do that too, just, and, and I think that is going at their pace. It's not totally just taking a day off necessarily, but it's saying, you know, let's just do the front of this page today instead, or let's do some drills so that you don't have to think so much. You know, when you see five times five, you're not pulling your fingers out again, you know, or trying to count closing your eyes, but you're like, oh, five times five is 25. So the plan for me with my kids, what I always planned on doing was going through up through algebra two. That's as far as I went. I was always a couple of years ahead in math. And so my sophomore year of high school was my last year of math. And that was algebra two. And I went into pre-calculus, I think on the first day. And I was like, oh no, yeah, no, this isn't for me. The teacher was talking theoretically and about this and that. And it just all came together to me like in this montage in my mind. And I just thought, no, th this is not for me. And like by taking this class, the amount of mental juice that I'm going to put into this, I am going to be missing out on other things that are important. So I went to Algebra 2 and with my kids, I always planned on, we'll go take them up through Algebra 2. And then after that, we'll see what their interests are because everything, there's, a, there's two sides to every coin. If you get into pre-calc and calc and trigonometry and higher, you know, theoretical math, I mean, that's awesome. But as a result, there's other things you're not doing. There's other parts of yourself that you're not developing. There's other experiments you're not doing. There's interactions with people you're not having. There's two sides to everything. And so I figured we'll go up through algebra two and, and even then, if after geometry, they have other things they're really into, then maybe not even algebra two, but I always knew I would go that far for sure. And then kind of see where they are after that in terms of like with their interests. The idea is for them to 
be busy and, and part of being busy is having free time, freedom to make new choices. So not a full schedule always, it's you've got things going on and then you've got this free time so that, that you have breathing room to try new things. But the idea was it is to make sure they're always busy so they're always progressing and growing. But with all of these core subjects, you know, history, science, math, reading, writing, things like that, giving them a baseline education so that they can acquire new information if they want to. So they have they have so that they have contextual understanding of life, of humanity, of gravity, of, you know, all these things. So anyway, so that's my take on math is it's not just, oh, okay, they'll do math every year. He, my, my son Diego, for example, is he just started seventh grade. He just turned 13. He is starting Algebra 1 this week. Actually, yesterday he started it. And he's going to do Algebra 1. I have his geometry curriculum, so we'll do that. And then after that, we'll assess it. I would like him to do Algebra 2, but like I said, he's, he's got a lot of other interests. He really likes like making videos and blender he likes to compose music he has an album that he made he wants to put that on the internet he has a lot of other interests so i actually don't know what the time space for algebra 2 will be but i think that it would serve him well if he can make space for it but that's been my thing all along he's gonna do algebra 1 it's a 30 week 30 lesson course assuming each lesson takes 30 weeks some weeks he may take the whole week off because we're traveling some weeks he may take half the week off some weeks he might need to take two weeks for a lesson and some weeks he might do two lessons i don't really know assuming that he does it in 35 weeks maybe 37 weeks i don't really know and we do not stop for summer math keeps moving forward he's got a like a year and a half and then he'll be done with math so mid eighth grade, he'll just be done with, with math unless he wants to do more. I mean, assuming he just goes to algebra. If he goes to algebra two, then ninth grade, early ninth grade, that, that's kind of the plan. We'll see how it goes. But instead of saying every year you do math, it's these are the concepts that I want you to understand and learn. And I want you to learn them at a pace where you're always making progress, but you're not overwhelmed or stressed. And then obviously as he gets older, he's using a lot more math. When he's making computer animations and graphics in Blender, he is using math. When he composes music, he is using math. When he does his budget, he is using math. He wants to learn how to do things with wood, like carpentry, woodworking. When he does that, and as he's kind of had some ideas for things, he's been doing math. And again, sometimes people avoid interests because of the math involved. And I really don't want my children as they grow up and, and become more a part of the world and embrace the world more, I really don't want them to avoid doing, doing certain things because of their limitations with math. And again, like I said, I use their interests especially when they were younger, as the why for math so that they could have their own internal, like, yes, I want to learn math, even if I don't love it, even if for its own sake, it's not fun. It's like doing a budget, right? Very few people like doing a budget, but doing a budget, whether it's a time budget, a space budget, or a money budget, enables you to be able to enjoy your space, or it en enables you to have the time for the things you want to do or it enables you to have money for the things that you need to have money for. That's that's kind of my take on math. So let's get specific. How are we doing this? What are we doing? Well, I want to say my children, I mean, children in general are visual, but my kids are, are very visual. They're very hands-on. My husband is very visual. He teaches music theory online. This is actually his studio, which is why I have a piano and guitar. And see this this is something that he uses to teach theory and it's visual i think and it's growing quickly and a lot of people love it because i think a lot of people are visual this hasn't been the case with everything but with our math curriculum the first one we picked was a winner doesn't mean that it's been great the whole way or that it's been a breeze but the curriculum that we chose has been wonderful so let me just get up and grab that So the curriculum that we use is called Math UC. 
This is put out by Demi Learning. It's very visual and hands-on. There are manipulatives galore. Manipulatives are things that you touch and hold and manipulate so that you can see what's happening. This, by the way, is the division level. So my daughter is in the middle of this curriculum now. She just started fourth grade and she's in the middle of this right now. Let me show you the manipulatives. I want you to see this because this is one of the main reasons why we've decided to use Matthew C as our core curriculum. So these are the Matthew C blocks. This is the block set for the elementary math, particularly up through division. It's the integer block kit. Let me open it up and show you. It's a little bit mishmashed. All of the blocks like interlock with each other. See this? See that? I don't know if it's blurry or not, but there you go. This has been totally awesome for my kids and it has helped them to move through math very quickly. There's also a fraction overlay kit, which goes with the level after this one, which is called Epsilon. And that's the, the year where you learn fractions. Hold on, let me see. So you can see these overlays in here that are colored to match the integer block set. It all goes together like really, really well. The, the, the way they do the levels in Matthew C, hold on just a sec. I wanna show you one more one more manipulative set. So the integer blocks are the first ones. And then you have this fraction overlay. So far, we've only used it for one year. And then you have for pre-algebra and algebra, the decimal insert kit. And we haven't used this one a ton yet. So again, it's colored and built and everything to match so that the colors and the, the shapes and everything that you've learned in this level is still serving you all the way back up as you're as you're getting into algebra I really like that I like the consistency of that and making it as visual as it is again my daughter is doing division right now so she's in elementary math still my son is doing algebra one so he's in upper math now the the levels the way they do the levels they name the levels at least for elementary math like lower math is they use the Greek alphabet. So first there's a primer or a primer, however you want to say it. I think most people say primer, but I, it has one M. So I like primer. That's like the preschool level. So if your kids already know how to count and they can recognize and write the numbers zero through nine, if they can write the numbers zero through nine, they understand they can count all of that. Then you don't need to do the primer. So we skipped the primer. We didn't do that, but you, you can really, it starts at alpha. So there's alpha, beta and actually let me get a chart they have alpha beta gamma delta epsilon and zeta so that's six levels i just kind of correlate it to the six years alpha is addition beta is subtraction and it's single digits and double digits it's all attract or <laughs> attraction all addition attraction was addition and subtraction put together <laughs> Alpha is addition, beta is subtraction, gamma is multiplication, and then delta is division, epsilon, epsilon, as you can see on the chart, epsilon, epsilon, epsilon is fractions, and that's where that fraction overlay came in. And then zeta is decimals and percents. I can tell you throughout that because I've been through that whole set with my older son, with my older child, with my son Diego, and then my daughter Francisca is in the middle of Delta now. So she's, you know, over halfway through the lower six levels is it's really cool. I know that they've kind of relaunched some things. And so it might be a little bit different now. It may automatically come with online instruction, but what you get when you order it, I mean, assuming you already have the manipulatives, they have different bundles. So if it's your first time doing Matthew C, but you, you know, but, but your child is in Delta, for example, you know, you can buy the manip manipulative separately. I don't know what all the different bundles are. I really don't know. I don't work for Demi. I'm just trying to be helpful to you. What you get is you have an instructor's book and it may not still be hardcover, but it's hardcover and it has the answers in the back and it has the lessons in here. Let me just find a lesson. Lesson 28, Roman numerals, I, V, X, L, and C. It's not in color, but you can see, um, so it's a lesson and each lesson is not a lot of pages long. Let me see, one, two, three. So that lesson is only three pages long and then lesson 29, fraction of one. You 
have all the lessons in here. And then in the very back, you have the answers. Systematic Review 29. So you can see it, and I'll tell you about these pages later. I don't know if you can see that. But anyway, so it has the answers to everything in the back of the instruct instructor's manual. And there's a video. So the the founder of all of this, his name is Steve Demi. So Demi Learning. Uh, he's over in Pennsylvania. And he's fantastic. He is great. There's a video lesson for each of these. So I will tell you the truth. My kids, we don't even really go through the lessons in the book together because he does such a fantastic job of getting in there, going through the lesson. He clearly explains it and then it's done that my kids from there have just been able to just run with it. There have been a handful of times where we've needed to go through the lesson to look at more examples and things like that. But very rarely. So there's a video component. You'll get it. You get a DVD with it. Again, I don't know if they still do the DVDs or not. I, I'm sure. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm an antique now. I'm in my 40s. So I have a DVD player, but I'm sure a lot of parents of young children coming up now don't. You get a DVD with the lessons, but they're also online. Like if you log into their portal, you can see the lessons. And I will show you a screenshot of that now. So you have the videos, DVD or online. You have the instructor's manual, which I don't really use a lot, but I have it. Then you have two books, like workbooks, and the pages are perforated, so I just pull the pages out. Uh, you can see, like, so the top corner says 23A. So this is lesson 23. This book here are the, uh, it's the student workbook. So these are like the work pages. And then this one is just a book of tests. So you can see here, it's a uh, test number 23. Each lesson has, basically my kids do each lesson in four days. In terms of the workbook pages, there are seven pages. There's, and they, so the lesson number, right, 23, and then it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then test. So my kids typically do the lesson, we watch the video and make sure they've got it on Monday, and they do A and B. Then Tuesday, they do C and D. Then Wednesday, they do E and F. And then Thursday, they do G and test. That's, that's typically how it works. And most of the time, that like they don't need extra days. That's pretty much how it works. And then Fridays, they don't have math except for every so many lessons, there's what's called a unit test. And I will turn through the, so lesson 30 is the last lesson, and then this is the unit test. So it says there's a Roman numeral four because this is unit test number four. So there's, I think about four unit tests in each one. So like every seven or eight lessons. And then at the very end, after the last unit test, there's the final test to make sure that they really understand what's going on. The final test, this final test is three pages front and back, so six pages total and then that's the end of it like that's it the uh, lesson tests are one page front and back and that's it so this is this is the lesson 24 test and if I turn that page two pages sticking together that's the back side of the lesson 24 page so it's not just like hours and hours and hours of work you make sure that they've got it and then you move on if for whatever reason they're really struggling if you log into the portal you can print off extra pages like like practice pages, which is really cool. Now, looking at the practice pages of the student workbook, the A through G, they're not all exactly the same. The first three pages, A, B, and C, are lesson practice. So they're just problems specifically from this lesson. They're all just doing the new concept. So you can see on the top there, it says lesson practice. That's what A, B, and C are. But, oh yeah, but then you go to page D and now it's called systematic review. And the systematic review includes everything that they've learned so far, like within the unit. I think sometimes it includes things from all of the curriculum, like all the lessons, but especially like everything within the unit, it kind of ties it together. So you can see on the top of D, it says systematic review. And hopefully when I hold this up, 
it's focused. D is a systematic review, E is, is a systematic review, and F is a systematic review. So three pages of just the lesson, three pages of systematic review, so tying it in with some of the other things you've been learning, and then uh, G, the last page from the student workbook before you do the test, is called application and enrichment. And on this page, you're using what you've been learning. So, you know, not often, but sometimes it'll be okay for a week, you know, measure the morning temperature and the evening temperature at your home. So the last page within the student workbook, page G is application and enrichment. And it's just always a little bit different than the other pages. It's normally like a project, like, okay, we're planning a garden and these are the dimensions and, you know, figuring it out that way. So it's like, it's like a word problem on steroids or like a mini project or something like that. I mean, and, and even for the weather example, you could even just look at the average temperatures for the previous week. You don't have to do it for like the upcoming week. And I never do like, we don't ever, we don't romance it to that extent. I try to spend 30 minutes like as a maximum on math for each of them a day so that it doesn't become a slog. And so some days they finish math in 15 or 20 minutes and it's easy like when Diego did averages, for example, averaging is the mean, median, and mode was super easy for him. And so those days he got math done in like 15 minutes. I don't pile on and go, oh, well, this is an easy one, so let's get it done in two days. They really choose the pacing. But then on the flip side, if something is very difficult, we don't drag it out. I just will say, oh, okay, turns out this lesson is a two week lesson. So instead of doing two pages, just do the first one today. That's kind of the idea. We keep a lid on it. We keep it buttoned up because I don't want math to become a misery and I don't want it to kind of become the planet around which everything orbits. We're not dying on that hill, but math is really important. So we do it every day. We do it through summer. We just, we, we do it all the time. And then when they have a unit test, we do that on Friday. You know, every seven or eight weeks, they do have math on Friday because of the lesson test, but otherwise they don't do math on Fridays, which is really nice. Friday, we do Friday light. It's kind of like when we were kids. Again, we, my generation, Friday was like Friday casual, like in offices and places like that. That's kind of how we do it on Fridays. Friday is project day for the kids. It's my day to do laundry and to clean and just kind of get the house refreshed for the weekend. We've been busy enough lately that that hasn't been happening the way it used to. Way back in the day when we still had our apartment, I actually used to clean the whole apartment on Friday, like from one end to the other. It was a thousand square feet. It wasn't huge, um, but it was, it was nice at the end of the day on a Friday having it all be clean. It's not like that anymore, but still in terms of academics, we try to start the week strong and then Friday is enjoyable because they get things done quicker. They submit their MyTech high learning logs when we have those. They, ha they have special different things they do. They refresh their rooms and vacuum, all of that, and they don't have math, <laughs> which is nice. What do we do in between? When they finish a level, like Delta, for example, I let my kids take a break. It can be a one week break. It can be, I think the biggest break we did was just over the summer, we did like a four week break. Typically when we take a break, we do Life of Fred. Let me show you. Okay, these are three Life of Fred books. The guy who created this series is, he's a, a, uh, an older gentleman in Reno, Nevada, and he's a, I don't know if he was a math professor or what, but he has his PhD. His name is Stanley F. Schmidt, and this series, this is, these are three books from the elementary series, are hilarious. When we lived in Florida, I knew a gal named Marin. She, super interesting, liked her a lot. If we still lived out there, we would probably be doing things together. Really great, but she introduced me to Life of Fred. The Life of Fred series, the elementary series specifically, each book is alphabetical. So the first book is Life of Fred, Apples. And then the next one is Life of Fred, Butterflies. And then Life of Fred, Cats, Dogs, and so on and so forth. I think it goes up through like I, or something and then like the intermediate series is jelly beans kidney beans or kidney and liver or something like that anyway but the series is really really funny he's teaching the kids math through story through this guy named fred fred gauss g-a-u-s-s -S. 
And Fred Gauss is a five-year-old. He lives in Kansas and he is a math professor. He teaches at Kittens University and he's a child but he's really good at math and so he gets himself into some situations because he doesn't have understanding of the world like an adult, but he understands math like an adult. Each of these books has 18 chapters. Each chapter is six pages long. And then at the end of each chapter, he has a section called Your Turn to Play. Just a handful of questions, like five or six. This one has four. And then on the back side, I skipped a couple of pages. On the back side, he just has the answers. And then sometimes he has other commentary after and then the next chapter. These pages are just black and white. A lot of it is like just done with like clip art and super rough sketching, but it adds to the charm of it. It's not a curriculum, nothing like that. He's just going through um, like mathematical concepts in story. And these books are hilarious. They are so, so funny to read together. Let me find a chapter and I'll just read part of it. Oh, and you can see, so he has like in the front, the table of contents, he has the chapters, the names, the pages, and then he covers, says like, these are the mathematical concepts that are gonna be covered. When you're using a story, when the math is not just in isolation, but it's actually being used in a situation, it's amazing how high of math you can do with little ones. So this is the first book. This would be for like a six-year-old. And for example, in chapter 13, it's called Silly Duck. He covers three plus four does not equal 15. Why Fred is not a bowl of soup. Ducks who don't tell the truth. X plus four equals seven, so solving for the unknown. And letters of the Greek alphabet. It's just, it's all kinds of, of off the wall things. He talks about deciduous trees versus evergreen trees. Like it's just, you're learning so much. I mean, I have enjoyed reading this with my kids. You're learning so much in, you know, as you're learning math. And that's really how life is, right? Like the way that our educational systems teach things kind of siloed out. I understand to some extent doing that, isolating things, you know, it's kind of reductionist, but really most things happen within the context of other things. Like you can only pursue science to the extent that you can afford to pursue science financially, for example, right? Like it would be great to go on a, like a dig that like a, like a paleontologist, right? Like, like it would be fun to go do that. But if you don't have the money to do that, you can't afford to take time off of doing other productive things, then you can't. Everything is just interconnected. So I really like this this series. Let me see, I'll just read like part of a chapter. Chapter 12, a leak. Water was shooting up into the air from the leak. Fred didn't know what to do. He had never been on a boat that was leaking. He tried sitting on the leak, that didn't work. He was too light. And then you see a picture of him like flying up. He ran down the stairs to the kitchen. Then he ran down another flight of stairs to the game room that had a bowling alley, a chess set and a pool table. You see that? So it's just like, like clip art. Again, I think that's part of the charm of it. He stopped to look at the chess game. The white king was in trouble. And he has this chess set and he's got an arrow to the king and then an arrow to two rooks. There are six different chess pieces. Once you learn how each piece moves, you can start to play. The rooks, for example, can move vertically, up and down, or horizontally, across. You now know one sixth, and then in parentheses, one over six, a fraction, of all the chess moves. See that? Like you're like you're exposing little kids to so much just in those two pages. It's a lot of fun. It's a great series. My older son, when he was like nine, 10, he would read one of these books in like an hour or two. And he would just be laughing like belly laughs. What we've come to is we do Matthew C. We keep it moving. If we go on vacation, we just leave it alone. If they need a little break, we just leave it alone. We just move at their own pace. And then after they finish a level, they take a little break from math, but they don't really take a, mat, a break from math overall. We keep using math and we do Life of Fred. There are other things that we've done in the past. Like I said, we've done the circumference series and we've done other math books. I have other math books, like just stories, mathematical stories that just kind of make it fun where they aren't just saying a circumference is the perimeter of a circle, but they're using it in a very funny, silly way where you remember, oh yeah, I know what circumference is because that story and that circle and they were confused. Okay, so a few things. So like I said, with the math you see, if it's not enough, like you get through all the pages and your child is still struggling, take a pause, 
lot, you know, you can log into the portal, you can print off extra lesson practice pages or extra systematic review pages and just keep working on it. You can also find other resources online that cover that concept. Something that I like about Matthew C is that he doesn't go too fast. Some of the lessons are extremely easy because it's like, you need to understand this before we move on. And it's important that you understand this to the extent that, you know, it might be kind of boring this week because you're just like, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Like, so simple. I like that. There are very few, if any, weeks where you do a lesson and you're just like, wow, that was overwhelming. So he has broken it down into bits and pieces that are bite-sized enough that it's just, it's not overwhelming and it's not too much. I also want to reiterate, you don't have to be an expert to be the, like the primary source of your child's math education. You don't need to be an expert, but you do need to be engaged. You need to care and you need to be actively involved. And you know what? It's good for us too. It's good to avoid dementia and things like that. I mean, I'm 40, I'm, I'm not 40, I'm in my 40s now. I used to be 40. You use it or you lose it. So it's, it's not a bad thing to be engaged in that process. My kids have come to enjoy this as much as I think someone who's not, you know, focused on like, you know, the philosophy of math or the theory of math. My kids enjoy this as much as you could expect any child to enjoy it. And they know this is just what we do. There are some parts of their education that we just do. I hope that they enjoy it. Their experience matters to me. You know, we move at their pace so they don't feel swallowed up, but also we don't, discuss like, oh, can I just not do math anymore? They know this is, just, this is just one of those things that you just do, like taking the trash out. It just has to be done. And something that I do quite a lot because we have a lot of time together, I point out often to them ways that the world is accessible to them, things that they're aware of, things that they can do, options that they have, experiences that we have, the ways in which the world is accessible to them because of their mathematical ability, because of their mathematical knowledge. That's it on math, on learning math. We do the math you see and we do the life of Fred and that seems to be working really well for us. Like I said, as we go on, Diego is kind of winding down his math curriculum, part of his education, but he's ramping up his usage. He's learning about compound interest. He's, we just met with our financial advisor last week. It's his financial advisor too, because he has his own investments. And so he's learning about compound interest. He's learning that, wow, like his investments are growing about as much as his dad and I put in each year just on their own. That's pretty amazing because he's like still a kid. He's looking at financial statements. He's calculating, okay, if I want my mom to run this errand for me, how far out of our way is it? How long is it gonna take us to get there? Like how much of her time is that gonna take? Like he's, he's using it so much more in his life and he's using it more in projects that he's doing. Anyway, that's it on math, how, how we learn it, how we teach it. I hope you liked it. I'll see you next time. Bye.